Calvinism is very often oversimplified and exaggerated, and it's also often mocked, misrepresented, insulted, abused for such doctrines as teaching that God can be glorified in showing his righteous judgment. They like to mock this and say, how on earth can you believe in such a thing? How can you believe that God is exalted through displaying his holy judgment against the unrepentant wicked? Now, when you have this kind of view, this kind of uh, mindset, I would say it is often due to the fact that you have a low view of God and a high view of man. You make man out to be this very innocent, well-meaning uh, being, and you make God out to be uh, not that holy, but he just wants to create people for the sake of punishing them and torturing them to please his, uh, his character or something along those lines. But we mustn't oversimplify the issues. We must be biblical, we must be exegetical, and we must look at the entirety of the biblical evidence. A verse that is often overlooked by both Calvinists and non-Calvinists is Isaiah 5.16, which says in the King James, But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness or set apart by righteousness the NASB says but the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment and the Holy God will show himself holy in righteousness the ISV says but the Lord of the heavenly armies is exalted in justice and the Holy God proves himself to be righteously holy the net Bible says but the Lord who commands armies will be exalted when he punishes. The sovereign God's authority will be recognized when he judges. So you see a very simple, straightforward, biblical truth in this verse. That God demonstrates his holiness, his righteousness, his justice through the judgment of the unrepentant, rebellious, wicked. See, Calvinists acknowledge this simple biblical truth. But how often do you even see non-Calvinists mention or teach or explain the ex exaltation and glorification of the Lord of hosts through holy judgment? See, God is not judging or punishing righteous people or innocent people who really, really want him. He's punishing the unrepentant wicked, those rebels who delight in evil, who have no desire at all for him or his commandments, who love disobeying him. He is justly executing his perfect righteousness in judgment, and he demonstrates himself as righteous and sovereign through the judgment of unrepentant wicked people. But in this context, this context even may refer to the Israelites, the people of God, perhaps non-elect Israelites who live in disobedience and sin and will therefore not enter into God's spiritual rest as we see in uh, Hebrews chapter 3. But note what the Net Bible's footnote says regarding the phrase, the sovereign God's authority will be recognized when he judges. It says Hebrew the Holy God will set apart, will be set apart by fairness. In this context, God's holiness is his sovereign royal authority, which implies a commitment to justice. When God judges evildoers as they deserve, his sovereignty will be acknowledged. The appearance of the Hebrew words for justice and fairness here is rhetorically significant when one recalls verse 7. There God denounces his people for failing to produce a society where justice and fairness are valued and maintained. God will judge his people for their failure, taking justice and fairness into his own hands. So you see, God is able even to judge his own people, the people of Israel. He punishes them and, and judges them for their wickedness, for their evil doing. And he is exalted in the process. He's lifted up. He's uh, recognized and demonstrated as holy, as just, as sovereign, as a mighty one. And 
uh, non-Calvinists need to see this basic, beautiful, biblical truth as well. That God, yes, is glorified and exalted in saving sinners through the cross and offering the world salvation by repenting and believing in Jesus. And at the same time, he is exalted and glorified through, demonst through the demonstration of his glorious justice. His uh, perfect righteousness against the wicked who will never repent and therefore deserve his condemnation. George Whitfield said, If God is not glorified in your salvation, he will be glorified in your destruction. Scary thought, but beautiful truth. So yes, God is glorified and pleased and delighted to save sinners through Jesus Christ. He offers the world salvation in Christ. He calls sinners to repent and believe. Salvation by grace alone, received by faith alone through Christ's work, his death, burial, and resurrection. He delights in repentance and faith. And he is glorified in redeeming and saving and forgiving sinners. But at the same time, to demonstrate his holy character, to demonstrate his perfect righteousness, he is also glorified and exalted, lifted up and manifested as the righteous, sovereign God of the universe in judgment. That includes physical judgment when he judges nations, etc., for their iniquity and rebellion. And that also includes eternal judgment in the lake of fire. God is not a God who is cheesy, but he's a God to be feared and respected. And if you haven't read the book of Isaiah recently, I do encourage you highly to read through all of it in the coming months. And it is extremely Calvinistic and God-centered, very theological, and yet also it touches your heart. So please read it. Some would consider it uh, like the gospel according to Isaiah. So uh, please uh, go through Isaiah and go through commentaries as well. And may you be edified in the process.